the Atlantic Ocean is going to be seeing another active year. It's the start of the hurricane season, and the time to prepare is now before a storm strikes. Hello, I'm WNCN Chief Meteorologist Wes Owenstein, and we know from experience Central North Carolina can feel the effects of a hurricane. The past three years have been very active in the tropics with 19 named storms each year. That's all the way through the T name. Superstorm Sandy is the most recent and memorable, causing an estimated $50 billion in damage in the U.S. So how's this year shaping up? Well, we went right down the street to personally ask the forecasters at NC State about their forecast this year, how they do it, and to find out what the next big thing in the hurricane forecast world will be. We are seeing you know, the numbers going all the way up to maybe 17. And that in a nutshell is what could be headed our way this hurricane season. 13 to 17 named storms, 7 to 10 of those becoming hurricanes, and 3 to 6 becoming major hurricanes. Last year it was 19 named storms, but that's not exactly what Dr. Shea and his team forecast. We went back to look at the model, and uh, the key thing here is some of the predictors we have selected uh, are not ordered properly. In other words, they're not picking all the right predictors. Those predictors are things like water temperature, wind shear, and global pressure systems. Figure out which predictors to look at before the season and in what ratio, and you can figure out what's going to happen during the season. Last year definitely is not the best year we have seen from our model. So that forced us to look into the model and see what went wrong. So now we then use our revised model, improved model, and use it to test historical cases. And uh, we found this new model does a be much better job than the one we had before. Now, in their 10 years of making seasonal hurricane forecasts, a lot of getting it right has nothing to do with hurricanes or weather at all. A lot of it's number crunching. The hurricane forecasting group, they use highly sophisticated dynamical models that I think millions is probably an understatement. Billions of data points go into that. And this, you need very powerful computers. I think the kind of research we do now literally wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. So hurricane forecasting has come a long way in the past few decades. But during our visit, we also got a taste of what kind of forecasts could be coming our way in the next few years. We're simulating for 20 years out or 80 years out for the end of the century. And if we can do the past climate correctly with the number of storms and the track locations and the intensity of the storms, then we have confidence in what we're projecting for the future. And that would be something, an 80-year hurricane outlook. Now, according to the state climate office, a hurricane makes landfall in North Carolina once every four years. And 75% of those that have come ashore since 1950 have been major hurricanes. Now, hurricane hazards come in many forms in central North, central North Carolina. Our biggest threat, inland flooding, high winds, and tornadoes. Now, it's been 17 years since Hurricane Fran struck our area. The Category 3 storm dumped nearly nine inches of rain on the Triangle, creating widespread damage. After the storms, many cities, including Raleigh, reevaluated response plans. The city of Raleigh's crews perform what's called a cut and shove operation, which means we open up the streets so that you can get emergency vehicles, emergency service, people can get around. We don't have a lot of extra people in. Uh, we use all of our city employees that we have, say, in public works or public utilities or parks and we divide them into two 12-hour shifts and we run around the clock uh, to try to get the roads clear and get, get things you know, returned to normal as soon as possible. And then, like I say, by the third day, our contractor should be in here and he, once he mobilizes, their equipment is a lot more efficient than ours are and so we can return back to a lot of our normal duties and let them do the loading and hauling of the debris. Now here are some things to think about that you can do at your home before a tropical system arrives. Remove debris from your yard. Cut back all those weak tree branches that could come crashing down on your house. And have the leaves thinned out so wind can flow freely through the branches, decreasing the, tr the chance that trees and plants will be uprooted. Now if you have overgrown trees, you also run the risk of them crashing down on your power lines, damaging winds from summer storms, keeps electric companies in our area on their toes. As meteorologist Bill Ray found out, crews are working now to prepare for the hurricane season. 
When Mother Nature's at her worst, power companies, including Duke Energy Progress, are standing by and ready. We work year round to ensure that we're ready to respond when the storm strikes. We have thousands of employees who not only have day jobs in the company, but also have storm roles that they perform when a storm strikes. Duke Energy's media spokesperson, Jeff Brooks, has weathered many storms over the years, and preparations are underway year round. If a storm threatens, staging crews and supplies ahead of time is crucial. We keep track of the storm with our team of meteorologists to determine where the storm's going to be going. We model what damage to expect, and then we move resources to the areas we expect will be hardest hit so that they can quickly respond to the storm when the storm strikes. After the storm passes, convoys of cleanup and repair crews move in. Our goal is to get as many resources as quickly as possible into the area once the storm has passed so that we can get power restored. We synchronize our efforts with local law enforcement and other government agencies, and it's a collaborative effort. Power outages can last for days or weeks, and while we can't prevent a hurricane, we can prepare for them. What are you going to do if you need to leave your home, if you need to be without power for several days, making sure you have flashlights and batteries, making sure you have a way to charge your cell phone. The cell phone is a lifeline during a storm. To report a power outage after a storm, here's the number, 1-800-POWER-ON. That's 1-800-769-3766. And remember to never touch a down power line because it still may be live. And be careful of lines that might be hidden under debris after a storm. Wes? All right, Bill, thank you very much. You know, hospitals deal with life and death on a daily basis, but what about when a hurricane gets thrown into the mix? With more than 900 beds, Duke University Medical Center is the largest in our area, so when a storm threatens, it's imperative that a disaster plan be in place. And the generators are uh, designed to actually support all of our critical areas in the facility. So all of our inpatient units, um, our surgery areas, our emergency department, and a number of other uh, high-performing areas that we need to be able to support the facility. And their preparations don't end there. With Duke Hospital being more located inland, it's it often answers the call for help from those along the coast. What we do prepare for is actually to receive patients from the coast who may be evacuated ahead of time um, or even during and after the storm. One of the biggest challenges is making sure that all of our partners in the community, um, including citizens, understand their role in preparedness. So being prepared, having a plan, monitoring the weather, and taking actions at home uh, to make sure that they're safe during inclement weather so that they don't have to visit us during a storm. And here's some additional advice that will hopefully keep you out of the hospital after a storm. Get a home inspection if yours is damaged and only hire licensed electricians. Remember, if there's water on the road, it only takes 18 inches to lift your car, so never drive through flooded roads and pay attention to flood safety guidelines and boil water alerts. Now, in the event of a major storm, several organizations band together to aid in relief efforts and provide safe havens for those forced to evacuate. Red Cross volunteers are trained to run shelters across the state. They partner with local governments to determine the best location for those shelters. Most often those are uh, schools or large churches where we can shelter people. We have uh, equipment such as uh, kitchen facilities, uh, bathroom facilities, even shower facilities so that if people have to be there three to five days, we can meet their basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. Yeah, it's important to remember that a shelter is not like a hotel. So you'll want to take your own supplies if possible, including personal hygiene items, medications, baby supplies like diapers and formulas, clothes, blankets, and something, of course, to uh, keep the kids entertained because there will be a lot of time to pass. You also need to think about family members with special needs. Unfortunately, most emergency shelters are not equipped to assist with individuals with special needs. However, special needs shelters do open on a county by county basis. Also, don't forget about Fido. You gotta take care of those pets. If you have to evacuate with your furry family member, you will need a crate to house them while at the shelter. It's also a good idea to have their vaccination records and don't forget about food for them. All right, still to come, a look at the building codes in North Carolina, how they compare with other coastal states and what you can do to lessen the damage to your home. Plus, living on the coast, stand your ground or retreat. We'll show you the growing trend across the country and how Carolina Beach is dealing with erosion. While many people dream of having a house on the beach, some are still recovering from the wrath of Sandy. Now an urgent question facing people living all along the coast, is our climate changing to the point where the only reasonable thing to do is to move away from the shore? 
Well, our Jeremy Baker went to Carolina Beach in search of answers. All along the U.S. coast, people are realizing that beach living is becoming less attainable. Holly Beach, Louisiana was flattened by Hurricane Rita in 2005. Pacifica, California battled with the ocean for decades, but gave up the losing battle and is now moving houses back from the coast in a $4 million managed retreat. In Massachusetts, the beachfront land by Melinda Crastine's Cape Cod home, which 15 years ago was a full acre, is now just a sliver. I knew as soon as I saw it like this that that whole part of my life was over. Her home now inhabitable. Here in North Carolina, unlike the Outer Banks, which were battered by both Hurricanes Irene and Sandy, towns along the southeast coast of the state were largely spared. Fortunately, we haven't been hit by a bad storm here in Wilmington in, in quite a long time. Residents of Carolina Beach are used to these powerful storms and are also used to fixing the main damage of beach erosion that they bring right now with a federally funded beach nourishment project. It starts um, at the north end of the island and um, pump sand all the way down to the south and usually takes about a month. But with a three foot water rise predicted by the year 2100 and a powerful ocean that wants to take away more land by the year, you would think those living and working here would be more concerned, but that just isn't the case. I haven't really considered it, you know, because we haven't had any problems with flooding where we are. Whatever perils come with it, uh, I'm willing to uh, take the chance and uh, enjoy the life down here at the beach. But money is also a big factor keeping them from pulling back like they're doing in Pacifica. And the cost of putting the sand on beach and keeping that static line of vegetation for our dunes in place and our, and our beaches in place, we more than see the return from tourism and the money that they bring into the community and to the state. And the tourism dollars are just what this area needs to keep the nourishment projects going as long as the storms keep coming. The Atlantic Ocean may be quiet for now, and with a little luck and some help from Mother Nature, Carolina Beach won't take nearly as much of a beating as it did in the past two years with Irene and Sandy. Reporting from the coast, I'm WNCN meteorologist Jeremy Baker. Now we'll send it back to the studio with Chief Meteorologist Wes Hohenstein. All right, Jeremy, thank you very much. She sure was quick to volunteer to go do that beach story. Nice job. Uh, further north along the Carolina coast, the state is trying to determine the future of Highway 12. Water overwash has closed the highway numerous times in recent months. Last year, Hurricane Sandy flooded the road, a similar scene to 2011 when Hurricane Irene severely damaged two parts of Highway 12. Now, the state DOT wants to build a permanent bridge to fix the problem and hopes to begin construction in the fall. The tentative cost, though, $90 million. Now, one way to cut your losses is to make sure your home is fortified. But as WNCN Today, meteorologist Bill Ray found out, even the building codes might not be enough to keep your home standing. Flooding at the coast and inland does the most damage in a tropical system. There are no building codes to fight the water. The safest thing is to buy flood insurance. Regular homeowners insurance doesn't cover it, and the cost can be high. Insurance is uh, creeping up along the coast, especially uh, east of I-95 and on the barrier islands. Um, it's just part of life down here. Wind damage, which is second to flooding in tropical systems, is something that homeowners can try to fight. You should first take a look at your roof. Check out this test from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. The house on the right had its roof trusses attached to the walls. The house on the left did not. And in 100 mile per hour winds, is gone. The roof should be also be sealed. If not, you run the risk of water damage inside. In this test, the shingles don't hold up, exposing the roof deck. Then testers poured up to eight inches of rain on the home, much like in a real hurricane. One side of the roof, had a sealed roof deck and saw only minimal damage. On the unsealed side, water was pouring through and parts of the ceiling collapsed. Sealing the roof deck will go a long way toward keeping wind and water out of your home. What we saw today on the side of the duplex with no tape on the seams, without the sealed roof deck, was water streaming in, cascading. It looked like it was raining inside as well as outside. And as a result, we've seen a tremendous amount of damage. If a family lived in that home without the sealed roof deck, they would be out of that home for many, many weeks, potentially even many months. 
Besides the roof, you also want to take a look at all the potential openings on your house so that that would be windows, doors, garage doors, skylights. You can cover those or you can make them impact resistant. The Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety looked at the 18 states along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico susceptible to hurricanes and they rank them in on a scale for their building codes and enforcement and you can see North Carolina came in seventh place they had a score of 81 out of a possible 100. Now our state obviously wasn't number one who was well a couple were really with a tied score Florida and Virginia came in at number one with a score of 95 each. The other states that ranked ahead of North Carolina were well they were New Jersey and also Massachusetts, Connecticut, and South Carolina. The state that had the lowest ranking, if you're interested, well, they hardly have any building codes there, and Mississippi came in with just a score of four. For more information on things you can do around your home to prepare for a storm, go to WNCN.com and click on the Weather tab. Wes, back to you. All right, Bill, thank you very much. When a storm approaches, most of us prepare to take cover. Still to come, what's it like to be a hurricane hunter and fly into the eye of the storm? Plus, well, I've got the harness on. Now I'm going to head into the wind tunnel, and in just a few minutes, I'm going to see how I can handle standing in hurricane force winds. So have you ever had a bumpy flight out of RDU? Well, you've got nothing on Stan Goldenberg. He's one of the most experienced hurricane researchers out there, but Stan's also one of the most experienced passengers on NOAA's Hurricane Hunter aircraft. I sat down with him a while back to ask him what it's like flying through a hurricane. Uh, one of the big differences, if you're sitting there on a commercial plane and you're hitting bad thunderstorm activity, and most people have experienced that at some time or another, a lot of turbulence, mm -hmm. I don't know the pilots, I don't know how experienced they are in that kind of weather. Uh, when I'm on a, one of our hurricane planes, I've got the instruments right in front of me, I have the radar, I know the pilots, uh, you're more free to move around and know what's happening, uh, and the planes are more made for that kind of weather. Uh, and we have a reason we go through that weather, to collect all the, uh, all the data. You also are on the committee. Um, that helps issue the annual outlook for the hurricane season. And I know you can't give a lot away, but I'm kind of curious, I mean, what's going on in that room when you guys are deciding on the numbers? We're all looking at the data and trying to come up with the data. There's nothing that pops out of the data and says, you're going to have three storms and you're going to have this and this. And it's interesting, no matter how much arguing or heated discussion goes on, when we kind of stop and say, okay, everybody give your first crack at the forecast, we're all almost on the exact same page. Let's go back a few years, back to the 90s. We had a lot of bad uh, F-named storms hit North Carolina. You were in the air flying. Uh uh, Floyd, Fran, do you remember those? I, I, I do, uh, and Floyd, of course, was a very, very strong storm, and weakened when it got to the Carolinas. Uh, it was very, very strong when it was near Florida, uh, but of course, for the Carolinas and other parts, it was a flooding event, mm -hmm. uh, which shows you don't have to have a strong storm to have a horrendous, horrendous flooding event when you have hills and mountains. Uh, but Fran, I was flying the landfall flight, so we were flying as it was hitting the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, you can remind me, was it Wilmington? Uh, yes. Wilmington, Wilmington yes. Southern well, Wilmington beaches. became the magnet for storm after storm for a few years. And uh, we saw from the plane uh, the storm was certainly not strengthening. It was starting to fall apart. The eye wall wasn't even fully formed anymore, but it was still a Category 3 storm, still a major hurricane. So we knew on the ground people were still getting clobbered. All right. Uh, great memory there from Stan. Great stories, too. But what's the strongest wind that you've ever been in? Coming up, our Jeremy Baker gets put to the test and finds out what it's like to be in hurricane force winds. All right, if you've never been in a hurricane, you may be wondering what hurricane force winds feel like. Well, we sent meteorologist Jeremy Baker to find out. Welcome to A2 Wind Tunnel in Mooresville. Their multi-million dollar wind machine is typically used by cyclists and race car drivers to improve performance. The way the wind tunnel works is it's a testing laboratory, so it's a controlled environment. Controlled and today, extra cautious since I was the test subject. Time to head into the wind tunnel. Dave locks myself and photojournalist Dan West inside. Hopefully I won't need these, but. Better safe than sorry. Okay, fans are coming on. We start at 10 miles per hour, a gentle breeze. But we're slowly gonna ramp it up. First to 30 miles an hour. That's kinda nice, that's not so bad. Then 40. This is the strongest wind speed I've ever been in. I felt 40 mile an hour gusts, but not sustained winds of 40 miles an hour. My mouth is so dry. 
and higher still to 50. With Dan safely out of the wind tunnel, time to resume the test. He just put it up to 60. Whoa. I really got to brace myself for that. And we weren't done yet. We're about to go into a category one hurricane. A big difference for just 15 miles per hour more. Now the last stop, 85 miles per hour. I can feel my lips. I can only imagine. But before shutting down, we decided to throw a rag horizontally in the air just to see how it would move in hurricane force winds. Did you see that? If not, here it is in slow-mo. That's a workout, man. All from just standing there and holding on for dear life. Just to give you an idea of how strong the winds are, Dave is standing down there 40 feet away where I was, and I let the rag go, and the wind was so hard that it went straight back at the same height that I let it go at, and it's embedded in the mesh now that the fans are completely off. Now add rain, blowing sand, and debris, and you've got yourself a hurricane. Safely inside this controlled environment in Mooresville, Jeremy Baker, WNCN News. All right, great story. Let's hope we don't have to deal with that anytime soon. That about does it for us, but don't forget, when severe weather or hurricanes do hit, WNCN is with you all the way. You can access all our resources on WNCN.com under the Weather tab, and you can also take the WNCN weather team with you anywhere you go by downloading the best weather app in town. Just search WNCN WX for your iPhone or on the Android market. All right, on behalf of everyone here at WNCN, we thank you for joining us and hope that when a storm does hit this year, we will all be ready.